Award-winning photographer Mark Edward Harris has visited all seven continents and more than 100 countries. On this episode of The Crit House, Mark discusses his My Five Images from Alfred Eisenstadt, Gordon Parks, Nick Utt, Sam Shear, and W. Eugene Smith. So for you out there who do not know Mark, Here we go. Uh, his work has appeared in publications throughout the world and probably any publication you've heard of, it's a long list. His commercial clients include some of the biggest companies in the world. His awards are extensive, a Clio Award, an Aurora Gold Award, an Ace Award, an Impact Docs Award, and uh, Sports Photography of the Years. Mark's latest book, People of the Forest, focuses on orangutans and received a first place in the nature book category at the International Photography Awards. He is a Stella Pro champion of light, a member of the Think Tank Pro team, and he is represented for his editorial work by Zuma Press. Mark Edward Harris, uh, you, have an, you have an impressive resume um, and impressive body of work as well. I appreciate you saying that, Jeff. Thank you so yeah, much. Well, Hopefully there's some new things ahead. Uh, oh. Too. We'll see. It's you're only as good as your last picture. I don't know what there must be some good expression out there for you that. know. I, they they probably say that in the commercial world, but I think one thing one of the things about photography is that is that those images last for a long time, so people can look back at your at your body of work, and it's not just it's not just the last image. Well, well that's said. the way I look at it. And no, and actually, I agree with that completely. That's that's very true. So, so how do you, um, you know, I gave like a little list of things that, that you have accomplished in your life, but when you talk to people about what you do as a photographer, how do you, what do you tell people? Like, how do you describe yourself? It's a great question because, uh, I'm a bit unusual where I wear a lot of different photographic hats. Most people, you know, tend, especially in the U S you tend to be a, a portrait photographer, nature photographer, documentary photographer, and I do a lot of travel documentary work. And so sometimes it will go much more toward wildlife as when I did the uh, the People of the Forest, the orangutan book. But I also, in that same book, besides going to you know Borneo and shooting uh, in the wild out there, I also did documentary work on on the the palm oil situation and efforts with rescuing orangutans. And I also then did a lot of portraits with orangutans that were uh, unfortunately in captivity. But to really try to help show that they have, you know, we have 94, 96.4% of the same DNA, personalities, all that. So, 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 so in just that one project, I wore a lot of different photographic hats. And I find that that's very often the case with the projects I, I do. I, I really move across genres, which is a little un, unusual for sure. Yeah. Well, um, so we've asked you to go through this difficult task of choosing five images that have somehow influenced you or affected you either personally or artistically like what did you what, did, what was your thought process when you were trying to pick what those images were you know i i just i just sort of maybe i'll spend too much time in, in in asia though i always want to keep going back but but i really do try to empty my cup so to speak and not think too much and just sort of let things sort of flow in you know there's an expression you can't you know, fill anything into a full cup or you can't pour anything to a full cup. Uh, I, I think I've always gone by that. And so I just, when you asked me that, uh, I just sort of let images flow into my mind's eye. And uh, I, it was a great exercise and, and not surprisingly to, to myself, I didn't know which images would, would, would necessarily pop in, but not surprisingly, they were pretty much all documentary and maybe a little surprisingly uh, for me, they, they were all black and white. Maybe because they're older images, that's why it's black and white. Not that there was some great, you know, maybe I just gravitated to, to black and white. But definitely his, uh, the, the, the uh, freezing uh, history uh, you see in every single image. And, and I, I think that's a pretty much a constant in my interest realm, for sure. Well, let's, uh, let's go take a look at your images. Sure. So we start with, uh, with this... Alfred Eisenstadt image. Talk about this one and uh, why this is here for you, sir. Well, Alfred Eisenstadt, uh, as, as, as many of you out there know, uh, was one of the great, in fact, maybe the greatest Life magazine uh, photographer. He had an incredible life just to get to the United States. In the 1930s, he had to escape uh, Nazi Germany 
Uh, I used him in my first book on famous photographers. I had interviewed him for magazines before. Uh, and so I got to really know Izzy uh, very well. And everybody, you know, with, with photography, people know the images. They might know the name, and they probably don't know what the, the person looks like. And there's a few exceptions like Annie Leibovitz, uh, yeah. Ansel Adams, but but that list drops off extremely quickly after that. Everybody knows the sailor kissing the nurse, nurse in Times Square photo. So that's his most famous, but he had a long, uh, incredible uh, history with life. And uh, what one of his lesser known photos for sure is this photo uh, taken in 1946, a half year after uh, uh, the the uh, nuclear explosion over Hiroshima, and he was not allowed to go cover the war because he was technically he was a, a, a German uh, mm -hmm. when he well he was German when he came to the United States, and, and because of of, of that, uh, even though you know if you had to fl flee Nazi Germany because of being Jewish, but after the war he went uh, on an assignment. Uh, flew in a Piper Cub with uh, General Douglas MacArthur down to Hiroshima. And uh, among his photos there, he did this incredible environmental portrait that is so powerful, that brings back that day. I mean, you can feel the cold wind. Mm -hmm. uh, the hair, because you, you feel it because the, the hair is blowing across this woman's face. I, I can't imagine a more powerful environmental portrait, uh, meaning a, a portrait of an environment a person in an environment that relates to them. In this case, a woman uh, with her son. We have no idea what happened to her husband, uh, other kids or whatever. Uh, but the way he framed it with this burned out tree on the side, I mean, the, the trees are not coming out of their heads. You know, he he, he angled it in the right way. Uh, but you, you feel this sort of power, you know, this strength in a way too, or at least that's how I'm interpreting it. You know, they yeah. survive, but there's... Um, uh, there's just something elegant about this you know, woman as well, and 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 that you know look of the the child. Of course, I'm sure he had no real clue of what was, you know, gone on in his life. But well, but to me, to me, it's the ideal environmental portrait that conveys so much. Yeah. Gordon Parks with your your second image, an iconic shot. Yeah, and Gordon also was was a, a Life magazine photographer, and of course, Life was the in the United States, uh, the the picture magazine that everybody couldn't wait to get and, and see every week. Uh, to me, the, the symbol, the, this image is so symbolic, and he shot it to be symbolic. Yep. You know, this this is, I believe, 1942 in Washington D.C. He had come to Washington from to get a job with the Farm Security Administration uh, to document what they were doing, and before he went out. Uh, the, the head of the, the Farm Security Administration gave gave an assignment saying, go get yourself a cup of coffee across the street, go get yourself a top coat, uh, go uh, watch a movie. And Gordon thought, well, this is a very strange you know, request for my first assignment in Washington, D.C. And he did that. And then and every place he went to, he was hit straight on with, with prejudice, where I think he had to sit in a balcony, they, they didn't particularly want to uh, serve him uh, in terms of there's no customer service when he wanted to get a top coat. You know, at the coffee shop, he wasn't allowed to sit in a certain place. And so when he got back, and I believe it was Roy Stryker, who was head of the uh, FSA, said to him, OK, tell me what happened. And then Gordon described it. And and then he, and then, uh, he said, OK, Gordon, go out and, and shoot a photo that represents how you feel. And then this photo came about. Uh, it's not just the image, uh, but it's it's the story behind it and the man behind it that really uh, moves me. And and um, and once again, you know, freezing a moment in 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 time, and uh, you know, now we're talking, you know, over eighty years ago, and we still have lots of issues. Obviously, things have gotten much, much, much better, but we're still facing very real issues. You know, and and it's it's not just race; it's obviously religion. It, it's yep. it's people's choices, you know, sexual preferences, or everything else. And and I think this photo, uh, you know, American Gothic, uh, really symbolizes, you know, that we have to keep that awareness. And and so here's um, yeah, Nick's shot that that I thought might be uh, 
up there as well in, in terms of uh, of how many people have a lot of people uh we we have seen this a couple of times previously and 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 uh and previously by the way when we've showed this and i'm not going to do this this time yeah. i have um i have covered over um some of the more sensitive parts of parts of this image but um yeah. for this for this program we're going to show the image as it was shot well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I think it was a big Instagram thing, right? Where they deleted the photo or took it off and it sort of yeah. made world news. Uh, it, amazingly enough, years later, so this was shot June 8th, 1972. Uh, uh, Nick and I have become great friends. We travel the world together. He's an amazing person, amazing person. How, you know, his brother was killed Um uh, 1965 uh he, so nick's vietnamese he's the one who took the photo yeah uh and, and his brother was killed you know working for ap and then nick sort of he, not exactly took over but uh his, his sister-in-law helped him you know talk to ap and, and, and at a very young age started working in a dark room first and then got out and started shooting and but they wanted to keep him away from the battlefield so he worked in the dark room uh because they did not want to have happen to him uh, what happened to his brother but nick would get on a scooter and go out and shoot and he learned his his photo school was was in the dark room yeah. uh looking at all the work of all these great photographers and then soon he was out there and uh and then that particular day you know june 8th 1972 he was on this road near trang bang a, a village toward cambodia and the napalm came down and hit this uh, Khao Dai temple or nearby. And this is where Kim Fook and her family, and these are some of her family members were hiding and, and uh, Kim's clothes burned and she had to shed them. That's her um, her cousins running to the side who I've met. I've actually met her brothers in the foreground and then mm -hmm. her cousins to the her right, I'm sorry, to her left. Uh, and then I, I was in uh, last year, I uh, went back with Kim and Nick to this village and did a portrait of, of Kim holding Nick's photo right at the place where it happened uh, 50 years later. Uh, she's an amazing person. She, she uh, you know, works uh, sometimes with the, the United Nations with, uh, you know, helping out with, with kids. Uh, Nick goes around the world lecturing. They're really two amazing people, but, but, but I grew up watching the war on TV. I was a you know a, a teenager, same, and I remember hearing these you know body counts and all this, and then seeing these villages and not really understanding, you know, why is this you know, in, you know, going on? And and so my first big photo essay in the early '90s, I'd been shooting for a while, but when I finally realized you know you should be telling a story through a set of images, you know, a photo essay, not just individual photos, yeah. Uh, really was my my work in in Vietnam just before uh, the U.S. and Vietnam normalized relations, and uh, so the war had a, uh, and the images coming out of it had a huge impact on me for sure, no doubt. Well, talking about uh, images that were seared into brains in in my well at least my youth is this is yeah. one of those images that I remember from. Uh, when I was young, seeing and and just being amazed by, you, I I agree, and of course this predates our lives. Yeah, uh, you know, as does you know Gordon's shot and and, uh, and Isaac's shot, uh, but that's the amazing thing about photography. Uh, we have these visual records, uh, uh, you know, historic records, and um, you know, equally famous to this. That that I, I I know you uh, you've heard as well and must have had an impact was was the radio broadcast. Yes. Uh, of I mean probably wouldn't you say probably the most famous radio broadcast besides a War of the Worlds you know mm -hmm. we, even more so oh the humanity more so oh the humanity wow I mean just amazing and then we have this still image this frozen moment in time by a photographer that probably uh, most of us. Almost nobody would know his name. Wouldn't necessarily come down through history at all. Except no, I didn't. I didn't remember his name when you when I, when you sent it. And and to be honest, neither did I. When I you know I I knew the image, and so I looked for the image, but I I had to look up his name. Uh, unlike the other photographers, uh, I didn't know his name. But boy, what a frozen moment in time! And and so yeah. this is really the magic of photography. 
uh, that has never left me. And it combines everything that sort of I'm fascinated with, you know, history, uh, the camera's ability to freeze a moment in time. Uh, you, you could you could cite Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment right here. Yep. I mean, this 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 photo says it all. I mean, it's it's the and and I think Sam only had two frames in his um, in his medium format camera, mm. and, and look how he put it to use. I mean, just this unbelievable. And, and and he said he shot from the hip, literally. That's how fast he had to pick up his 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 his, 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 his the camera and shoot. Uh, because of course nobody could have possibly fathomed that this was about to happen. No. It was going to be, you know, routine, you know, news reporting, of course, of a big moment, it, it, you know, the, the Zeppelin coming across and, and, and mooring, but, uh, it, you know, but th then it takes the great photographer to, 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 to have the wherewithal to freeze that moment. And you could, you know, think of, you know, Eddie Adams, you know his shot in 1968 during a Tet Offensive of uh, the execution of, of the Vietnam yes. infiltrator in, in, in Saigon. Joe Rosenthal flag raising, which is also a photo I did consider. Yeah, this this photo when you just look at it, I mean, a, a single image. Uh, you know, they say well, it's worth a thousand words. Uh, can you imagine how many million words have been um, have come out of this image? And perhaps. Uh... Well, I don't. I don't know how to even describe this image, but just the, yeah. the powerful nature of Eugene Smith's documentary photographer in Japan, photography oh. in Japan. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he really uh, the, the influence on on me in terms of how to tell a story with a set of images, you know, from you know one after another, uh, Spanish village, country doctor, and then of course Minamata. This series right here. Uh, about the mercury poisoning, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, you know, a, a company uh, just kept letting mercury go right into uh, the ocean in Minamata Bay, uh, off the southern island of Kyushu, Japanese island of Kyushu, and so you know, uh, it would go into the plankton or whatever uh, you know that the fish eat, uh, and then the people would eat the fish, and they they would get these serious deformities and. and horrible situations and it became known in Japanese as Minamata Bio, Bio meaning sickness. Uh, so a Minamata disease. Gene went down there uh, and spent an incredibly long time there because that's how dedicated yeah. you know, uh, Gene was to telling a story. It's not about, you know, a, a prophet. It was about humanity and, and gave him the story across. And this photo epitomizes that, uh, you know, a mother, you know, caring for, her, her child with with um, with Minamata disease, and you see the love here, the caring. Um, I mean, it's a heartbreaking shot, and the whole series that they did there is heartbreaking. And it did bring a it did bring about change. You know, obviously nobody's pro chemical pollution, but there's a lot of people that turn a blind eye to it. Yes, in the name of profits, and that's the case in Minamata. You know, the fact that it went on for so incredibly long is 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 criminal. Yeah. I mean, there's it is nothing, you know, short of that. And, um, uh, and so this humanistic approach to photography really resonates with me. And, and this photo epitomizes uh, that approach. Well, Mark, Mark Edward Harris, um, five incredibly powerful images to, to discuss. Um, thank you for bringing them on. And it's been, it's, it was especially uh, helpful, I think, for me. Um, to not only see the images, but also to know that a lot of those photographers you have personal experience with um, and to be able to get those stories directly from you. Um, thank you so much for participating with us. No, Jeff, thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor being on our program. And thank you all for watching The Crit House.